welcome to the first ever episode of Brew Beer 101 on YouTube. So, um, my name's Pedro, this is my pop shed, if you can tell around me already. We've got all the optics on the wall here, uh, gin mixing station, and we've got the two Angram pumps as well for the barrel beer that we brew here at home. So, we're going to be looking at all the different types of brewing beer with the free vessel technique, which is a more complex all grain. Um, to your starter kits, so just the boil in a bag, so to speak, and uh, even the all in one systems with the single vessel, which is the more modern approach to brewing, which I'm going to be doing for the first time on video as well, so we can go through the mistakes I make, etc., um, and, and see what I think of that, um, and what also the final result of the beer will be on a kit that I haven't used before, which will be interesting. So the first video that I wanted to do was a unboxing of the new equipment that I've ordered. Uh, we'll go through that. We'll also have a look at my old system that's not actually assembled at the moment, but we'll get into that in the video. Uh, but yeah, we're going to do our first brew today with the new system. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it's it's going to be a bit of a, a faff, I should imagine as most things that you haven't done before are. Um, but yeah, as long as you make beer at the end of it, then there's no such thing as a bad brew. Every brew you do is a lesson to be learned somewhere, and no brew goes the same. Even if you're using the same equipment with the same ingredients, uh, you've always got different temperature gradients of the room you're working in. There's so many variables in brewing beer. It's what makes it the interesting hobby that so many of you and myself love doing. Um, it would be boring if it was just the automated uh, mass commercial type brewery. Uh, it's the home brew, you're making the parts yourself, you're honing your own equipment in, and it's that that hopefully will keep you and me interested for many years to come. So as well as going through how we brew the beer, we'll also enjoy a few pints in the pub shed here. Um, we'll do a bit of a tour of that pub shed on another video as well. Uh, we'll have a look around at what we've got in here. Um, but this is obviously the bar setup as it is, and it's the middle of the day at the moment. It's a bit unusual to be in here in the daytime, normally only in here past dark. <laughs> so inside here we have got the Brewster Beacon 40, as well as enough grain, hops, yeast, etc. to do two brews. So as you can see, it was very well packed. We've put the brewery on top, and the box of all the malt and everything on the bottom, because obviously that's quite a bit of weight in there. It's all been proper bubble wrapped on the outside of the boxes as well. So let's have a look what's inside the boxes. You can smell the grain coming out just from cutting the tape. It smells delicious. Empty this out. So first of all we've got our 10 kilograms of extra pale Maris Otter crushed uh, malt. Easier for the crushed than non-crushed, just saves you one extra job of having to do. So you're having to have the equipment to do it as well. Try and keep your uh, footprint of the operation as small as you can to begin with, is my advice. There's a kilogram there of chocolate malt. We've also got a kilogram there of uh, light crystal. So obviously that'll be dependent on what you're brewing. Depends on what grains you're going to be buying. Um, normally I just use cane sugar. Cane sugar from the supermarket. Um, this time round, I'm going to actually use the proper brewing sugar. The sanitizer, the cleaner, gypsum as well for the water quality. The Camden tablets, again for water quality. We've got the different hops that I've ordered, the yeast, and protoflop tablets as well. So we'll get them opened up. And that just leaves the little tea bags. Whatever you've got, I never use these. I've always just chucked the hops straight in, in in the boil. I never use these ever. But with the new machine that we're going to be trying out today, I see a lot of people are using these. So we might or may not use them yet, I don't know. It's just your immerse, immersible chiller. Like normally, I use a counterflow chiller. So for the hops that we've got for these brews, we've got Foggles. Pretty standard in everything type of brew. Everything we brew in the UK tends to have foggles in the recipe. 
um, SARS, it's quite exotic. Uh, is it Czech? I think it's Czech, off the top of my head. And EKG, which is your English Kent Goldings. And then lots of people use different types of yeast. We've always used the Saffir SO4 for the types of brews that we brew. Never had any problems with it. Always gives a great beer. So we'll stick with that, stick to what you know. And then your Protoflock tablets, it's just the same as using Irish Moss, a teaspoon of Irish Moss in the brew towards the end, the last 15 minutes of the boil. Or you can go for a Protoflock tablet, go for the tablets again this time. Like obviously we're not going to use a kilo of chocolate malt, we're not going to use a kilo of crystal malt, and we're not going to use 10 kilos of extra fail Marisota. So we're probably going to end up with a kilo or two left of that, uh, most of that left, and probably about half of that left. But that just means that when you're doing your next brew, you can then obviously, as long as it's not too long down the line, you can reuse what you've already already sort of got in stock. So just to be clear, the chiller doesn't come with the Brewster Beacon in the box. You have to pay extra for this. Obviously, you can buy it with the Brewster Beacon at the same time to make up the full kit. If you haven't got a chiller already, um, you're going to need it. You can't not have a chiller effectively. Um, I mean, you could leave the boil to cool down on its own naturally, but you're going to be waiting overnight, I would have thought. So I feel like the one arm bandit here with me scissors again. So as you can see, Brewster Beacon 40. So these are the same as so many other ones on the market. Brew Monk to name one. It's, it's not really bothered on price. Uh, there's like a couple of quid in it, depending on which one you look at. Um, so what have we got there? So that must be the very, very bottom mesh that protects the pump. Should we just lift it, mate, for now? That'll be the top and bottom of the grain, the grain bin or mash ton, mash bin, whatever people are calling them these days. Mash ton was always the old school way. There's the little handles with that as well. So I'm glad the kids ain't in here because they'd be stealing all these bits by now. We've got tiny little clips and stuff in there as well. I don't know if you can see that. Tiny little split rings, zip ties and stuff. So if, like I say, if I just get it all out of the box to begin with, it the easiest way. Nice glass lid. Good to see it been delivered unshattered. You can already see the stainless steel shining through. Ball slowly in there. So as long as the box isn't damaged, because there's quite a bit of clearance around it, it shouldn't have any dents or dinks in it. I know that's what a lot of people are scared about when they get these things shipped rather than buying them from an actual shop. So I've just lifted that straight out. If it's got anything else in here. I'm guessing that's the recirculation pipe and then there's nothing else underneath the polystyrene so push that out of the way so let's start with getting this cardboard off here the actual mash tun itself will be in there so there we are so, Brewster by Brewolution. So I'm a bit sceptical about these, to be honest. It's part of the reason why I've bought one. I'm hoping that it does work as straightforward as what everyone else has sort of found with it. But I'm quite cynical when it comes to an automation type thing. I like to be involved. So the auto function down here... That definitely won't be getting used by me. I like to take everything as it comes. Every brew is different, no matter how much you try and do in the same. Uh, even the temperature where you're trying to brew, so like inside the house, for example, in the summer, it would be warmer than in the winter. So there's just one difference where you're going to have temperature fluctuations with your mash, etc., etc. Um, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see what sort of results we get from it. I noticed on this one because you're getting the sight glass which is plastic. It's probably better that that is plastic, to be honest, because you don't want glass to be there, because it's just going to get broken, isn't it? 
Um, and then you wouldn't be able to use the vessel without sealing that off. But I noticed that some of them, they have an outlet tap here. Uh, with this one, you haven't got that outlet tap. So that basically means everything you want to discharge out of here has either got to be siphoned out using an external siphon tube or you're going to have to pump it out using the pump tube. That's your two choices, which isn't a bad thing, but it is worth noting. No outlet valve on the bottom. I mean, it wouldn't be hard to drill one and put one in, but do you want to do that on a brand new vessel? Probably not. So everything's not tight on it, no, that's slack. So job number one, obviously, you're going to have to go around and tighten everything up to make sure that you get no leaks. Mash her out. Mash her the bear. It's not as big and scary as you'd think for... If you are looking at first-time brew, it's... I mean, the height, it's not even as tall as my hip. I mean, I am six foot two, but so height wise, it's not too tall. That's on that clip, that's on that clip. That one hasn't clicked in down there. No, it has. So it's a bit of a tight fit actually in there. With weight on it, obviously that'll help it anyway. Once it's got the weight of the grain in there. So yeah, that's as tall as she goes. So it's quite a small footprint really. It's something that you can do on the kitchen worktop. So let's get the instructions out and see what the spondoolie says. It's probably about 16 pages of nonsense. Oh uh, no, it's just drivel. Don't worry about the instructions, you ain't going to need them, it's going to be self-explanatory, isn't it? So let's just open this box up and see what we've got in here. The overflow pipe, I thought, was screwed, not telescopic. Um, I thought it was the older ones that were telescopic and the newer ones were screwed. And the main reason I thought that they'd gone away from the telescopic would be because it would be impossible to clean inside there, inside there, inside here. So obviously you can clean the inside pipe, you can clean the outside of the pipe, but there's actually a section there which, no matter what position you have it in, will never be uncovered to be cleaned. So I always thought that was a bit of a risk, a risk of bacteria and stuff. So I prefer the screwed version to the telescopic version. And I was looking at these online. But to be fair, it's, uh, it's probably me just being paranoid because anything pre-boil doesn't really matter too much obviously you should keep everything clean all the time but the um infection is going to have your beer after after the boil when it's cooled that's when you get really bad um anything infection will wipe your beer right food for thought the tube that goes off the pump get a bit of rubber tube with it as well nice flexible tube actually so i'm sure when that heats up it probably tries to slide off this pipe so that just basically sits on there. I mean, you've probably all seen these. I know. And using your cam locks. This is what these are called. Cam lock. Cam lock connector. So you have to lift them to put it out. Yeah, and when they're down, you can push them both down, clickety-click. And that's a good steel, stainless steel fitting. The reason why they use these cam locks is, again, because of hygiene. It's a good easy connection that's able to be cleaned but also quickly removed so that's why they use cam locks in brewing um, these valves are just standard standard plumbing valves in fact it's almost like a washing machine one with a blue tap the blue tap on here would denote that it'd be cold water um, so yeah they could have put a black one on there to be honest instead of blue which would have looked a bit better but it's only a tap valve so who cares what color it is so down here, now, my guess 
Okay. This little stud here is probably to do with the temperature sensor. I would suggest it's PT100 temperature sensor. And that's probably the, the the location of where it reads the temps from. So it's another point with, obviously, the kettles when you are boiling, etc. You've got a lot of height difference. So if it's, say, 66 degrees down here, doesn't necessarily mean that it's 66 degrees up here. So that's the one reason why I'm sceptical when using these types of like auto functions and stuff on these boilers. So don't just rely on your temperature read out on here. You should always be checking your temps with another um, temperature gauge. Because if your temperature is off, it's just going to ruin your beer from, from the beginning. So, so far, no idea what that is. Doesn't go on the end of this pipe. It may go on the end of this pipe, but then it won't fit that pipe. So you're better off with this pipe, so far anyway. So we've got a spare O-ring for the cam lock fitting. And this will be the little bung, power bunger, for the top of this, to stop any unwanted grain going down the overflow. So this, obviously, bit of foam here, just so when this gets really hot, it doesn't burn your hand when putting it in and out. So we've got two metal sheets, identical to each other. The only difference being the two holes. So that's just got one in the middle. Whereas this has got two holes, one on either side of the centre hole. And that's for these little handles to go in. So this will be the top lid, not the bottom lid. Don't worry, I will be getting a screwdriver and tightening all of these properly. Rather than just doing them by hand. So now a telescopic pole, straight up the middle is it? No, nope, not on the bottom. So that way keeping the same orientation as the other one. Nice heavy duty stainless nut, it's a coarse thread on there, it's a good solid, good solid grip. So now that'll sit, won't go past the bung. So that now will allow to always keep that one fully extended and that will allow us to lift this now Ooh, nice sign there then we can just lift that straight in lots of scratchy scratchy signs little cut it's on the end of this if you can see that stop it from sliding off and that'll just lay in there to grab the whole handle right we have what i would consider the first design floor rightly or wrongly so okay, you've got these tabs on the side that locate so if we put it in we've got to put it in with the tabs in that position so if i put it all the way down now like that i can't lift the, the handle back out because it's resting on the handle on both sides. So that means you've then got to turn it to drop it a little bit lower. So now it's sat on them resting pins and then I can get the handle out. So now when you come to lift it back out, you put the handle in and then when you lift, you then hit the supports because they're now turned at such a degree that they're in line with that so that means you've then got to twist it to be able to lift it actually out so for me personally i would expect the handle holes to line up with the two tabs not offset to it if you understand what i mean by that so that would mean that i could lower it down straight down all the way down and take the handle out and then lift it all the way back up if i wanted to and it would also mean that trying to eyeball while lifting to stick the tabs on the top I would know where the tabs would be because they'd be at the ends of my handle drive you bonkers eventually so that would just sit like that when we're going to mash it's all a bit tight but it will be because it's new sure she loosens up once she sees 100 degrees a few times through it so the rubber bong's obviously for this I think that is a spare o-ring the bottom of here 
where the sight glass sits into. There's an O-ring I can just make out down there. So that will sit like that under the glass. I say glass, plastic. And then these two little cross washers, which were in a separate bag. They are going to be off these two little screws. Off the back of here. I dare say, to stop them from coming undone and then dropping the screw and dropping these off and then ending up with a screw in a load of mash. So we'll have to put these on now before I forget. So we've got a spare washer for the cam lock, we've got a spare washer for the sight glass and we've got two random cable ties which I don't know what they're for. So we're not doing too badly on the air construction front. Pack all this away and then we'll get ready to stick a brew on. But we'll go and look at the old brewery that I used to use as well before before we do kick on with the brew. Just so you can see what I've been using for several years now. And whether this is an upgrade or downgrade, I don't know. But it's definitely something different. We've got all the different vessels that we used to use. Plus the barrels, fermenting vessels and everything else that you need. So we've got three barrels here, one of them with a pressure gauge. Not that it's required. It's just uh, intrigued into what was going on. So we've got a few things here, like the boil. So the boiler itself, you can see in there, all the copper work and everything's actually made. We can go into that in, in a lot more detail. If it's something that you want to see, then obviously just let us know in the comment section and we'll hit that up. So this is my old chiller that I was using. This has all been stripped down from when we moved house a couple of years ago. I never got round to rebuilding it. But I wanted to get back on the brewing, hence why we've gone for the more um, compact system. So I'm hoping, obviously, if I do get used to using that system, that all this will go. Then we'll store everything out in here. So it'll help us for space. But little things like uh, this counter flow chiller. So inside the hose, there's a copper pipe wrapped in copper wire. So the cold water travels in the hose the opposite way to the water travelling the opposite direction and it's that that cools it down and we used to get down to like 18 degrees from boiling in no time whatsoever probably as long as it takes to, to drain a barrel basically 10 minutes at the most so and that was with the hose actually restricted on these valves so not using full flow but just restricted back so it was an amazing feat of engineering that we managed to managed to get that beast working so the boiler is just one of them Signet T urns with the thermostat in the bottom, the thermal trip linked out. So it's just constantly giving off 2,500 watts. But this has done loads of brews, as you can see. Obviously it's dusty now, but nice, nice and clean. Everything's got to be scrubbed down before and after use. But this is our way of filtering beforehand. So that would basically sit kinked like that, allowing us to draw all the way down to the bottom, down to the element in there. That was the way that it filtered the hops after the boil, when we used to drain the boiler down. And that just simply slotted in to that hole like that. You cannot beat these glass thermometers for telling you a true temperature reading. They're so accurate. Um, they're not likely to be out of calibration or, or anything like that. They are very fragile though, that's the only downside to them. Especially if you're stupid enough to try and use one as a steering spoon. Prepare for it to smash in your mash. But yeah, always double check anything digital with these analogue temperature. Put them in the boiler, it's the safest place to keep them. Put the lid back on, make sure you never get smashed, it's always there ready to be used then. And then our, our uh, mash tun. Mash tun used to just be this 40 litre core box. So you always write down what your losses are. So volume loss in this is 4.5 litres. So you end up with 4.5 litres lost in here because it was stuck in the bottom. Um, but that was obviously from rinsing. It's a bit different to how it does it on the Beacon Brewster. Brewster Beacon, whatever you want to call it. Um, because you don't keep sparging until there's no water left. You have to measure your sugars that are coming off the grain. Not just go, oh, I'll do it until it's full. And then I hit my volume and then that's that because you're washing tannins off the grain, 
which you don't want in the brew because that can cause cloudy beer later on even though you're using protoflock etc etc to try and get rid of that cloudiness you can still get cloudiness from the tannins um so yeah we monitor this using the refractors which again we won't go into now but it's in the box there somewhere we can go a lot more in depth if you want to do just let me know this is our spar jar so with, with the mash tun start same principle as the boiler just a simple made copper 15 mil pipe do everything since it's nice and tight and that's just a push fit copper fits inside that and that's how, how that works so then all we do with this then is this is slotted so again it's slotted all the way around in the bottom so when this is sat on the bottom it doesn't block the slots because the slots come up the side but also the grain sits on top so it doesn't get underneath here and block the whole flow off so that's how we control when we're, we're getting our mash out so yeah so if you imagine that this is mashed for x amount 60 minutes or whatever it is and then we slowly start draining this off here through here to the boiler we're using that as our filter and the grain bed obviously filters it the first couple of liters we drain off we then recircle back into the top of the mash and what that does is it helps settle the bed so you end up with a nice filter bed if you like look at it as a filter rather than a mash um, so you want a nice steady flow through it so then when you're sparging what you need to do rather than pouring drugs on is use something like this obviously it's looking a bit ropey now because it hasn't been used for a couple of years so it's gone a bit gangrene but yeah all this has had through it is just hot sparge water so then this would normally sit straight above this like that and it showers evenly across the grain so you don't get any uh, short circuits through the grain bed so you're not short circuit and any, any water straight through you're washing the maximum amount of sugars off as you can so you, you run a steady flow through this and the sparge process normally takes about 25 minutes even half an hour sometimes just gently sparging off and like i say you're measuring the sugar coming out of here the whole time every sort of couple of minutes you check it just to see what you're coming down to when it gets down to a certain number of bricks um, you, you, you cut it off then you don't want any more out of the grain even if it's just like half full of water it doesn't matter you just leave it that's it done and then we have another cool box which is identical to this one but that's just a sparge tank so that one is literally just empty with an inlet valve and an outlet valve and that's what we filled with our sparge water up with so obviously i'll be using one of these vessels now it's just a sparge tank and that's why these like the sparge arms has these connectors on for example so you just screw straight onto these valves it's all um, high temperature fittings so you don't get any leaching off rubbers or anything like that you can't just use standard hoses from screw fix because they will leach certain chemicals into into your beer and give odd flavors i should imagine so that's what they call a free vessel setup so obviously once you've sparged all your mash water into here and you're happy with what you've got in the boiler that's boiled for an hour or however long your, your boil time is that's when you then drain off using your outlet valve here into your fermenting vessels with a bubbler on 10 days in there with your yeast uh, and then obviously from there siphon into your barrels with uh, priming sugar to help get the co2 levels up and then with these types of barrels rather than bottles you've got your co2 canister which screws on the top of there so these are little canisters of CO2, which we literally just screw on the top of there. And it's that that we keep these pressurised so then the beer can be served for quite a few days, rather than just cracking the lid off it and drawing out with the pumps. So that pretty much summarises what we used to brew on. Never fear, we could be brewing beer. <laughs> so before brew day, first time you use it, it's always worth checking through any leaks on any of the fittings so we've just got cleaning water in there at the moment so we've got about 10 litres in there using this cleaner steriliser so obviously I've read how much of this to add in so it's 4 teaspoons for 2 gallons near enough 10 litres so it's been circulating around in there all the bits are in there it's been in there for a good half an hour now I've just been playing around with the temperature settings on the screen here trying to work out what sort of wattage to use for a cleaning cycle so this needs warm water not hot water hence why I went for 55 degrees 
and it's maintaining it even though it's above the 55.3 and the heating element will be off now because it's overshot its mark it still shows you that it's heating up here which is good because at least you know that it is taking control I'm only down at 900 watts instead of the maximum 2500 and that's purely because we've got such a low water level in there only 10 litres so the timer does count down as well that started on 90 so we're now down at 50 so it's had a good half an hour or so soaking so we're going to decant all that now but before we do another check to do so we've done a volume check I've put 10 litres in there using obviously a litre jug, measuring each one at a time. It was bang on at 5 and it's also bang on at 10. It's a little bit lower now because of the pump running, obviously filling this pipe and the pump underneath um, takes up whatever that is. A quarter of a litre if that. You can see the water level there. Obviously we are losing a little bit of steam through here and the lid, although it does fit it's, it's a little bit loosey goosey. It's obviously printed circuit board PCB on, is what powers this, not what turns the element on. It's this that controls the element, the heating element. And then you've got your pump on the side there. So you can see it just valves fully open got full flow coming out and that noise you can hear isn't the brew the missus put the dishwasher on before she went up to bed so we're here mucking around with this now listen the dishwasher whirling around so like I say we've, we've checked for leaks before we started brewing always a good thing we checked for volume just to make sure the volume's correct which it is and then always worth checking the temperatures anything digital you can't beat these as I've already said it's worth getting yourself one of these a nice long stick one so 30 centimetre thermometer with uh, one degree increments all the way up to 110 degrees centigrade not that we'll see that and if you ever wonder why it's triangle on the end and not round like the other end so when you put it down it doesn't roll off. Genius. So I'm going to open it up now so we can check the temperature using this. So you can see there the sort of flow you get out of the pump when it's on full. When it's on full. Obviously the valve fully open. Try not to drop the phone in there. So because I switched the pump off, it's actually heated the bottom up quickly because it's not recirculating. So it just shows, because the measurement's right in the bottom there, close to the element as I showed you earlier, that you will see weird readings with the temperature, which is why you should always check with these. So we'll see what we come out with now. So I make that about 57 degrees. See how quick these react to temperature changes. See it dropping very quickly now, taking it out of the water. So I made it about 57 degrees, and on here we've got 56.5, so it's about half a degree out. Which in the world of brewing, some people will be like, oh, half a degree, not half a degree. Whereas really, who cares? As long as we're within a degree or two, it should be fine. One thing that I'm not sure about though, with the PID control on the temperature in here, is how what the tolerance is basically between heating and not heating. So if we're aiming for say 55 degrees, when does the element turn off? Is it at 55? And when does it turn back on? 
I think the temperature control on this isn't that great because you're doing a lot of it yourself on the power set point simply because if it's trying to juggle with like 2000 watts with only 10 litres of water in there it's going to be on and off, on and off, on and off all the time so what you want to try and do is get a steady temperature heat to match the power wattage that you need so I think about 900 watts is about right to get 55 degrees for, cook, for cleaning purposes that ain't going to scold you when you put your hands in to give it a white rain so I'm going to clean all this down now, drain it all down, give it all the wipe down and then it's ready then to go tomorrow ready to be used for the brew it's also worth noting as well with it still plugged in at the wall put the PCB off, the pump will still work this is handy so that concludes the video for the unboxing of the Brewster Beacon 40 so I hope you enjoyed the video and if you're looking forward to our future content then please hit the subscribe button if you like the video then don't be afraid of hitting the like button and uh, leave us a comment below if you've got anything you want to add or anything you want us to look at in the videos in the future then don't be afraid to comment I'll always try my best to reply to you as well and uh, I look forward to seeing you on future videos cheers